Welcome to the AC. My name is Casey. I get to serve as one of your pastors here, and uh, it is a great joy to be in the presence of the Lord with the people of the Lord. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who actually does strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails by daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. Teddy Roosevelt, April 23rd, 1910. My question to you this morning on Vision Sunday is, are you in the arena? Men, are you in the arena? Molly. Women, are you in the arena? Yeah. Students, children, are you in the arena? How would you know if you're in the arena? Well, I believe this passage from Teddy gives us some insight. You're marred. You're bloody. You're exhausted. You have air about you, but you tasted triumph. You've seen things that other people can only dream about. Are you in the arena? Let me be very upfront with you before we begin. There is a lustfulness of my heart that desires the seats. There's something about me that longs to not be in the arena. Now, I know how to lust in various areas. I'm pretty diversified in my sin, okay? I can, I can do it in, in a lot of areas. But one of the areas that I recognize myself at times wandering into is this dream, if you will, or this desire to just take a seat to not bleed and err and do it again and again and again. So if that's you, if you're in the arena and you're loving and you're like, warriors talk, you're talking my language now. Or if you're in the arena and it's taking every thread of your ounce to stay on the field. Or if you're in the seats and you've been watching, but the Spirit is beginning to call you into the arena, let me be the first to tell you today is your day. Today is your day where God, I believe, wants to meet you and do something that's never been done before. Father, we ask that you would fill us with your Spirit. Give us your presence, Father, your promises and your power move within us and among us and send us out different in Christ's name. Amen. 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 And so it's a joy here for me to share with you Vision 2020 and what this will look like 
as a continuation of something that started last year. It's been a two-year vision, and we continue to move forward. And let me be very clear to you that Jesus lives in the arena, as does Vision 2020. Well, where, where do we anchor this? What's, what's, our, what's our hope for Vision 2020? Is this just some sort of dream that came up? Let's take a look at what the scriptures have to say, uh, because they have been our anchor in Vision 2020. Um, and if, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John 14. It'll be behind me and, and on the screen there. It'll be up oh, there. It is awesome, awesome, on the screen. This has been our guiding, our guiding light, if you will, for Vision 2020. Jesus speaking to his disciples, saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So this idea of Vision 2020 is really anchored to this passage and the promise that Jesus makes that we will do greater works than he has done. That's a crazy promise if you know anything about the life of Jesus. Here's a guy who walked on water, fed 5,000, brought dead people back. I mean, so I don't know about you, but in my course of walking with Jesus for, well, I got, yeah, I came to know the Lord when I was 13, I'm 45, so whatever the math works out there to be. Um, every time I jump in a pool, I sink. Boom, right to the bottom. My wife makes fun of me because I've tried to float, and she's basically like, I'm paraphrasing, but you're so scrawny you can't float, you know? So I can't even float. Um, I try to feed people, you know, but, you know, I, you, you, with four kids, you, you got to be pretty creative, and it always seems kind of like, you know, uh, it's never like the abundance necessarily that Jesus had where he just kind of made it, and they ate, and then there was 12 baskets left over. We're, we're, we're like always kind of looking, and, and that's like an effort for us to feed our family. And, and, you know, I've seen cool things happen, but, you know, as far as the dead being raised, well, I didn't, I haven't seen that. No Lazarus has come out in my, in my understanding. And, and so you have to ask yourself the question, what does that mean? If we're going to do these greater works, what, is, what does that mean? And as you look at the life of Jesus, what he was about, and then what the early church was about, and why the church has been sent on mission. Yes, it's for the glory of God. But all these things point to the kingdom of God coming, and people like you and people like me being able to receive the kingdom of God through faith in Christ's finished work on our behalf. This is an evangelical greater works. And so let me clarify. What Jesus is talking about here is that in his three years of public ministry, there were some awesome things that happened. He ushered in a new day, or he actually fulfilled what, what the Old Testament looked forward to. But what Jesus is saying is that the disciples, and thus the church, we're going to do even greater works because we're going to see the gospel go out exponentially more than what Jesus saw in just his three years of ministry. Are you with me on that? Okay, so we get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of seeing the gospel advance in some pretty crazy, awesome ways. And so that, those, are, those are the greater things. The greater things. And that's, that's really what Vision 2020 is anchored to. Um, a great question to help us as we walk through uh, this time in our church history is what is God doing right now? What is God doing right now? Um, it's one of the Blackaby brothers who says, just figure out what God is doing and join him. So I don't need to be super creative Vision 2020. I just need to seek the heart of the Lord and see what he's doing, and then we, we just join him because that's going to be better than anything I can come up with. And let me tell you what, what God is doing here in our particular time. God is doing a move through an organization called Church United like I've never seen. It's happening right now where churches are coming together and they're laying down um, uh, maybe historic prejudice. Um, they're breaking through walls. They're, they're even laying down their labels and their need to be known as a particular church so that the church can see the gospel advance. Unity for mission is what's happening. And Church United has a goal of, in 2023, seeing the amount of Christ followers in South Florida double from 3% to 
That's a great goal, absolutely, absolutely. What we said is we want to do our job. We want to do our part. So we looked at some of the metrics that we have for, um, you know, for, for things that are important like that, and, and I'll, I'll define them now as metrics of discipleship, if you will. And there's, you've got baptism, which, which would measure like new life, and then you have church membership, which would, which would measure growth and maturity. And so we just said, Lord, uh, we, we looked at our number and we're like, hey, let's try, to, let's try to be in a space where we're coming close to doubling those numbers for us so that we can play a part in this vision. And for us, um, we looked at, we were like, okay, so that would be 200 baptisms over the next two years, of which we're in this vision one year, and it would be 300 members. Okay, and, and, and so um, in, our, in our sort of area of capacity, that's what it would look like for us to join God in what he's doing. And again, we're, we're not going to be a church that's like all consumed with numbers, but numbers are important because A, they represent souls, they represent people, they don't, they're not our identity, but they represent people, and, and, and the scripture is full of numbers. And it helps us to also gauge some metrics of where we're going and how we're doing. And so um, what's cool is today is, uh, is, is really a day that uh, we're, we're going to get to celebrate. And I'm going I'm to share some of those things with you um, in just a minute. But, but basically, in, in, the, in the course of trying to get after 200 baptisms and 300 um, uh, members, I'll go ahead and share them with you now. Uh, we have, to this date, uh, up until February this month, a year and whatever, a month in, we've gotten to uh, baptize 109 people. That's pretty awesome. And we, we've seen 181 people um, uh, in members uh, beca- uh, that, that are current members right now, and there's 16 in our current onboarding class, which is super awesome. So we just want to say thank, thank the Lord for that. Again, let's just thank the Lord for that. Here's what we said, though. In order to see this vision come true, in order to see this vision become a reality, we would need a shift. And so let's take a look at some of the shifts that we said we were going to need to make over the next two years. Um, and they are, they're, these things are where we were, and this is where we're going. I'll, I'll read them to you. They might be in your outline. You probably have an outline, and hopefully you have a book. We produced uh, membership, it's kind of like annual report books that celebrate a lot of this stuff and cast vision. If you didn't get a booklet, let us know. You could even raise a hand right now, and we would get you a booklet. Um, we'll just, we'll make that happen, or you can get one on your way out. But we said, in order for this culture to become a reality, some things need to shift. You know, it's like, if you want to run a marathon, that's awesome. Super cool goal. But if you're used to running like 5Ks, guess what? Something's going to have to shift. You want to see double the amount of people you baptize? You want to see the gospel go forward? You want to see the church build up and and become a family that is um, on mission and following the heart of God? Things are going to need to shift. And so for us, we recognized four shifts. And, and the first one was from attendance to expectation. Um, and what that meant is we were pretty good at attending things, but I don't think we were where we needed to be at expecting God to show up at the things we attended. Expectation. We've preached now two series on expectation. Normality to hospitality. We're pretty good at loving the people we're supposed to love. The people who look like us and maybe have our last names. Hospitality, gospel hospitality, is going at great expense to the other. We're working on that. We're working on that. Ownership to empowerment. We were pretty good at the AC. We're getting ready to celebrate 10 years in September. So we've been pretty good at the AC, at owning things. And people will work really, really hard. And here's the shift, though. We need to get better at empowering others to be sent into the field rather than just owning all the work ourselves. We're working on that. And then finally, information. We're a pretty awesome church when it comes to information. We've got a lot of people out there that have a lot of information. But what we want to see is a shift from information to invitation, inviting you to actually do something in that moment with the information you have. You with me? So those are the shifts. We preached a series on each of these last year. We're preaching a series on each of these this year, and we've identified a primary operating system for each of these. Because I heard, I forget the conference I was at, but um, it was something from a a, a church in Alabama where they said, you can have vision, that's awesome. But if you don't have a system to carry out your vision, it's just going to remain on the wall. 
You need a system like a car to take you there. And so we've identified some of our primary operating systems for expectation at Sunday morning. This is, it happens at other places, but this is one of the systems where that culture can flourish. And, and, and what we're doing to, to see that flourish, man, Sunday morning is a, is a systematic way where we gather together and expect God to do great things like he's doing right now. Um, hospitality, uh, we've, we've looked to uh, John Hicks as our community uh, care pastor and our discipleship pastor and the connection team to usher in systematically a greater degree of hospitality. And God has been doing that. Um, as far as empowerment goes, our primary operating system for empowering people at the Avenue Church is in onboarding. That's where you learn about your spiritual gifts. It's where you learn about your personality. And it's where, like on a day like today, you get to meet the serve teams and take that next step into being empowered to serve the local church and beyond. And then finally, um, invitation. Our primary operating system for where we grow a culture of invitation is in our small groups. We've got, I think, 21 small groups happening right now. And you're going to hear about Jesus and be invited to meet Jesus on a Sunday morning often, hopefully, but where you really fall in love with Jesus is in community. And that's where people get to invite you to Jesus over and over and over again. And so um, what's really cool about all this, and, and this is certainly a time of, of celebration, and, and we can go ahead to the, to the, yeah, awesome, a time of celebration. One of the things that I want to celebrate is um, how this is happening through our people here, through, uh, through you guys. And, and I think um, before I, I kind of work down the, the different areas where this is happening, I want to celebrate the fact that God has brought us somebody new to help usher this in into even greater capacity. Um, and uh, you, you saw her, uh, you saw her this morning already. She is the artist formerly known as Allison Good. Um, Allie Hicks, would you stand up please? Allie Hicks, stand up please. We are celebrating, and I wanted, to, I wanted to start with you because you're our newest addition, uh, formally uh, to be offered a position, and, um, and we, she is, uh, she's accepted, and it's, it's been super awesome. Allie's going to come on as our women's ministry lead and vision strategist, where she's leading our women, all things women, but she's also looking into and helping with and having the authority to bring strategy to the vision that God's given this church. Thank you, Allie. We're celebrating things specifically in two areas, God's spirit and God's spirit amongst his people uh, doing his work. And there are um, serve team leaders, and there are small group leaders, there are deacons, there are elders, and there are staff. If you happen to fit in one of those categories, that means that you've been, uh, le you've been leading the way. Would you please stand up so that we might celebrate God's work among you? Please stand. Check out this quote. Volunteer church leaders are working for the church in its ministries during whatever small openings they can find in their schedule. A schedule that includes work, school, child rearing, family crisis, financial stress, and more. They're studying, praying, and preparing after the kids are finally fed and asleep, the house is semi-clean, and the dishes are piled up in the sink. That's a pretty good night, right? <laughs> semi-clean in a pile. And if you're really good, you soaked some so it doesn't get crusty. <laughs> Instead of relaxing in front of the TV, they're opening up Sunday school curriculum or something else they have to prepare for and getting ready to give the church several hours that, quite frankly, they really don't have time for. I want you to hear something. We see you. We love you. And we say thank you celebrate you and your yes to Jesus and his church. 
So the question is, where, where do we go from here? What, what, what's next as far as this year and uh, Vision 2020? Expect greater things. And so um, the cool part is, it's a two-year vision. So we are continuing the course. We are continuing to stay steadfast in what God has told us to do, which is make this church and this movement primarily about the lost getting saved. Primarily about people like myself and you understanding that we are in a sin situation, that our hearts are sinful, that there is a God who is righteous, perfect, and just, who should not and in according to the scriptures, cannot accept us in our sin or else it would compromise his holiness. But in his love for us, went on a rescue mission by name and sent his son to a cross so that on that cross your sin and mine could be crushed so that we could be forgiven. The guilt and the shame and the suffering of our sin put upon Jesus him dying the death that we should have died and overcoming that death and on the third day offering us freedom, Hallelujah. forgiveness, and a new family by faith in his finished work. That will be the lead of Vision 20 and as long as I have pulse and get to serve in this position, it will be the lead of everything we do as a church. That gospel message. So I did ask the question, well, where do we go from here, Lord? What, what does Vision 2020 look like in 2020? And again, if you have your Bibles, um, we're just going to finish the passage that we started. John 14, 13 through 14. This is, this is right on the heels of what Jesus said. He says, you're going to do these greater works. And then he, finish, he finishes by saying this. Well, there's a whole passage, but, but this is the next portion of it. Whatever you ask, okay, remember, this is connected to the greater things. Whatever you ask Say this with me. In my name, this I will do. We got to be careful here that we don't take this out. Sometimes you might get around people who take this out and read it like, whatever you ask, this I will do. Jesus is not your genie in a bottle. This is an in my name asking. I'll explain that in a second. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. So here's our why. That the Father's glorified. Not so that we hit some metric and we can applaud ourselves. It's that people fall in love with Jesus and give their lives to the Father and experience the great joy he has for them. Amen. That's our why. If you ask anything, say it with me, in my name, I'll do it. That's a pretty amazing promise. And guess what? We're going to need it because if we're going to do these greater works, it's going to have to be from somebody greater than you and certainly greater than me. Because I know my potential, I know my problems, I know my limitations in me. And here's what I'm learning. I don't have to live there, though. Because it's not just me living. It's Jesus who lives in me. So my potential is as great as Jesus as he works this greater thing out in and through us. Amen? All right. So what does it mean to ask for things in the name of Jesus. Very simply, it means in his character. Like according to his word. So, so we, we want to be careful not to think, well, I can, I can just think of things that I want and ask them and then attach in the name of Jesus and expect to get them. No. It has to be according to the character and nature of Jesus. So that would mean that if you want to start asking for things in the name of Jesus, you would have to know Jesus. And even more specifically, you would have to start to get to know what's on the heart of Jesus. I mean, that's, that's what happens in a relationship, right? The more you get to know someone, not only do you know their character and their nature, but then you actually get to know the things they love and are passionate about. Isn't that what Valentine's Day is all about? So Valentine's Day, I, I was, um, I put my hero cape on, and I was going to be the Valentine's Day hero in my house, okay? Now, mind you, I'm kind of a last-minute guy sometimes, so it was February 13th, and I did hear, Target is closing in 30 minutes. Target is closing in 15 minutes. 
I don't know if they give you another warning or not, but they just like, you know, they look at you like, come on, bro. Like, I got a life. Like, come on. You know, so, so um, February 13th, I was there, and I had my kid, and I, you know what? Valentine's Day hero, go. And so for my uh, four-year-old son, nailed it. Remote control car, crushed it. For my three-year-old daughter, Cora, nailed it. Uh, lip gloss, I don't know, things that, like, I just, I felt like I could spend all my money on her. She was the easiest that I could get, this and that and whatever. It's just, just a ton of little things that she thinks are awesome. Um, for my 18-year-old daughter, nailed it. I got her a little, um, uh, like a throw blanket because she's going to go to school uh, here soon in Indiana. And it's like warm and like, you know, when you think of this, cuddle me. And a $15 gift card to Starbucks. Crushing it so far. And, um, and then my son, I was like, I don't know, not exactly sure. He's got a couple of office shirts, but you know, he's not, whatever. And so I ended up getting him some like smell good body wash because he's, he's like a man now. You know, he's my 14 year old. And 15 bucks to Starbucks. And then it came down to my wife. Now remember, Valentine's Day is all about knowing the heart of the people that you're trying to love, right? And so in my hand, I had a frying pan. I'm not lying. It's no lie. No lie. Thank you for booing me. Thank you. Now, to my defense, listen to me. To, to my defense, it was a non-stick frying pan, okay? Like, and she makes eggs, and then like, with it, like it sits, and like we got to soak it sometimes. And so I was like, oh, take care of my baby. <laughs> non-stick, baby. She's going to love this. It's going to be awesome. Because listen, I, even though I'm the more... Like, um, I don't know what you would call it, but like I'm kind of into like the romantic crazy stuff than my wife normally, but she's also, she loves like, uh, she's practical and she, she's the more like I'm, so I had a thought that she would like this because we might need one and it would serve a need and then I thought of her and then it was either the spirit of God or the spirit of don't be an idiot that hit me and I put it back and I got a Chili's gift card. Why? I actually asked her after. I'm like, so baby, what if I would have? And she's like, nah. <laughs> you did good with the chilies. <laughs> because it's her heart. I almost made a mistake. I almost made a mistake. Be because um, it's important for me to know their hearts in order for me to pursue them to the fullest. If we want to ask in Jesus' name, we have to know his heart. We have to do some work some preparation, if you will, to know his heart. And one of the things that I've been learning with Vision 2020 is that as we walk in this vision longer, things get clarified. Like what God wants to do, what is burning on his heart. And I want to just take a moment to clarify some of those things so that as they happen, we can both be prepared for them and participate in them. Let's check out this next slide. So, so what are some of the things that God is doing in our midst that we might prepare for, that, that, we, that, we, would, that we would get ready for? And, um, like, I, I, I feel like the Lord just identified these five areas that we're, we're, we're doing these things. These aren't like, hey, we're going to start doing Sunday mornings. We've been doing them for uh, about 10 years. Yeah, like, like these, are, these are things that are already happening, remember? We just want to join God in what he's doing. But the clarity that I feel like I want to share with you this morning is that these are some areas that God wants to bring the greater works in. So like, let's get ready because greater expectation, watch, requires greater preparation and greater participation. So where is it that we need to continue to prepare and participate. Five areas. Here they are for you. Sunday mornings, young families, recovery, foster care, and Church United. Let me explain briefly. Again, areas where, where we believe God is going to bring these greater expectations. He's doing it in other areas. Don't, mis don't misunderstand me. But it's just that he's, 
like highlighting these areas I believe for us to step into and be ready for the greater works to come, especially in 2020. Sunday mornings. Here's the deal. Like we're, we're getting ready for Sunday mornings like we never have before as a church. I just want you to know that behind the scenes, we've upped the value, in, at least in our minds of, of what Sunday morning is and, and how it happens. And um, man, I just want to say just a direct thank you. Uh, you don't see him. He's kind of like, he, a little bit like the Holy Spirit. He just comes in and you're like, oh, he was here, but you didn't see him or hear him. Matt corwin has been doing a fantastic job with that. Thank you so much. So man, I just want to say we're getting, we're, we're ready for Sunday morning. Like all right, ready or not, this is crazy. But like we believe that God shows up in a special and mysterious way when two or three are gathered or 200 plus and the name of Jesus is lifted high and the word is preached. We believe God shifts things in your life. We believe that he meets you there. When you come forward for prayer, we believe that when people lay hands on you, it's, it's like the, the hand of God representing, being laid on you. And we, we, we're believing for healing. We're believing for restoration. We're believing that, that as we speak vision, God's speaking vision to you, we just believe that God meets us in a special and unique and awesome way on Sunday mornings that oftentimes he doesn't meet me during the week in the same way. He's meeting me, and it's really cool, but when I gather with his people and we've lifted high the name of Jesus, it's like, man, the Lord is present and on the move there in a really special way. I'm not saying it's better than how he meets me. It's, it's just different when we gather together. And so we're ready, and we're asking you to be ready. So we're asking you to be ready for Sunday mornings. So when you come to Sunday morning, we don't want you to be an attender. We want you to be an expector. We want you to actually expect God to show up in your life and in the life of this church in a way that he hasn't shown up all week. It's cool to expect that from God. It's cool to go ahead and lean into that. We want you to be ready. We want you to have read your scriptures we want you to have spent time with Jesus if you're a follower of Christ. We want you to have been in community so that your heart is postured for him to speak something new into you, for him to move in you. And if you don't know Jesus, we just want you to come and be like, what is all this craziness about? I'm just, I'm just here's, how, here's how I'm going to be ready. I'm going to stay curious. That's your readiness. Don't just come to another Sunday service ever. Come and be ready prepared that God wants to do a greater work on Sunday morning. Well, what about young families? Well, God's been doing a great work in our young families area, and, and this used to be a church where, um, this is, a, this is, this is a, an over-dramatization of what I'm about to say, but it used to be a church of like a lot of single guys who like to smoke outside. It was like, <laughs> that was the AC. It was like early days, that was kind of, and that's cool. Hey, it's like awesome. Those are our peeps. So what's up? Great. But here's what happened. They didn't leave. They just got married and had babies. And more families came, and now God has been shifting us into a church of, like, young families with all sorts of different demographics, not just one demographic. And, and so what's really cool is that God's already doing this work here among us, and we're expecting more. And so You'll see things like Kingdom Kids, and we, uh, a lady by the name of Patty Heal has been added to the team to work in, in scheduling and, and those sort of things. And so, like, like, we are preparing. We want you to participate and prepare as best you can in what God wants to do uh, through our young families. We've added a high school group. I mean, God is on the move here. Recovery. This is super exciting. Um, in recovery, we've always been a church that um, has been completely open and sensitive and love the recovery community. And the recovery community has probably influenced this church more than any other community. Yeah. And we're thankful for that. I mean, if you want to know about the culture of the AC and how it mixed with it, like that's kind of, that's a huge part of our story. Um, but we think we could actually do better 
and we think we could actually do more. And in order to prepare for what God wants to do um, in the recovery movement in our midst, in the greater things as it pertains to recovery, um, we are getting ready to launch. Uh, it'll probably be sometime later in the spring or maybe this summer, what's called a recovery church here on this campus. There's a, there's a vision meeting to talk a little bit about what that means. And it is basically a church that meets midweek and is very open and welcoming to people in recovery. It's a great combination of the big book and how that, how that has beautiful uh, interwoven themes with the scripture, points to Jesus. And then the recovery church, because it's a great first step for people in recovery, it actually then feeds the local church. It doesn't take away and isolate. It actually meets, welcomes, and then feeds the local church. And so we want to be a part of that. And that's a step that we're taking because we believe that God wants to do an even greater work in the recovery community. Um, foster care. So foster care, foster care has been on our hearts uh, for a while, and, and we've, we've been involved in foster care. Um, and if you're a foster family right now, or you help and serve a foster family, would you stand up so that we can say thank you to you, please? So here's the deal. We believe that foster care is um, it's on the heart of God. We believe it's on the heart of God uh, because the, the true religion, according to James 1.27, is to care for the widow and the orphan. And um, in order for us to prepare for these works and in order for us to, to get ready for what God wants to do, uh, we want to take a step of advancement in foster care. And, and, and here's what I'm asking. We this is what I believe we need, so I'm just going to ask for it, and however the Lord responds, that's cool. Um, we need somebody to lead our foster care efforts. Whether, whether that's going to be more finances coming in so that we can offer a part-time position for it, or it's one of you who says, I can give at least, I'll start, with, I'll start off with five hours a week, and I can give all things to foster care to help our existing foster families and to help support a culture of creating more foster families. We're believing God for that position to show up. Okay, so I'm just putting it out there right now, and if the Spirit of God is starting to work on you in any way, like, hey, respond to me after the service and let me know, hey, this is something that I think God wants to do. I also contacted um, our local foster care agency here in the area for kids, and I said, what do you need from this church? I want a specific so that we can work toward it, so that we can get after the greater things, and this is what he told me. We need seven new foster families. Seven new foster families. That's what he wants from this church. So in the name of Jesus... I'm asking right now, Father, would you give us seven new foster families? That's an area we're going to be working in and getting after for the greater things. And then finally, Church United. Church United, again, is a move that has been happening in our area, and uh, we're a part of that move. And for whatever reason, uh, God has called us to lead the way in that. And so every month we host a local Church United gathering where we invite churches uh, from the Boca Delray region to come and gather. And we love one another and, and we, you know, we, we pray for one another, we worship together, and uh, we also think about some things that we can do together that we can't do um, separately. And, and so that's something that has been happening and I look forward uh, for us to continue uh, to see that happen, especially, um, as I mentioned, Allison coming on, being able to help out in some of these things. She has taken a step of leadership um, on the female side of that. And as we continue to lead in the Church United world, um, we, we want and we need you guys to participate in those sort of things, just like you did in the 21 days of fasting and prayer. You guys did a fantastic job of that, and God showed up as we did that with five or six other local churches. So here's my final question to us. And this is a question that John Hicks asked. I think it's a really penetrating question. Are you cheering or participating? Are you cheering or participating? As it, as, it, as it comes to Vision 2020, what are you doing right now? Are you like, man, those, th those things sound really good. I'm glad my church is a part of it. Or are you bloody and marred and super exhausted because you've been participating in it? Like, we, do, we don't need any cheerleaders at the AC. We don't need anybody who's in the seat saying, hey, you're doing great. Keep going. 
hey, I wonder, when did the pretzels come around? Where's that hot dog guy? It's like, man, we, we, don't, we don't need cheerleaders. This thing doesn't move forward without participants, without men and women and boys and girls who are in the arena. So the question again is, are you currently cheering on the vision or are you participating? I mean, like, do you want in? Do you want in? I've, I've got ways for you to get in. This is how you get in. Show, show our next slide here, please. This is how you get in. Pray, serve, love, and live. You commit to praying. Now, this isn't, these aren't just general. These aren't just general because anybody can do that. I'm going to give you the pathway to getting in the arena as it pertains to 20, Vision 2020, okay? Very specifically, you pray, but you commit to pray with us on Wednesdays. This isn't just praying anytime, whenever. That's cool if you do that. Awesome. I'm asking you specifically to pray with the Avenue Church on Wednesdays. We have a prayer group that meets at 7 a.m. And we Facebook Live it. You don't have to come. Pray in your jammers. Totally cool. Pray while you eat your oatmeal. Watch the video later in the day. Pray at 8 p.m., whatever. But I'm asking you on Wednesdays to commit to praying with and for the Avenue Church because right now we're praying over specific demographics and area of the Avenue Church and we need you because it's the fuel by which Vision 2020 will happen. Pray on Wednesdays with us. Serve. Serve on a team. Serve on a team. Today is Serve Team Sunday and, and we're inviting anyone who wants to go over to our AC offices where you're going to meet the Serve Team leaders. It's awesome that we serve in other places. Those are super cool things. What I'm asking you to do is to serve your local church on a team. Some teams serve every week. Some teams serve once a month. Whatever the case may be, I'm asking you to find your way to the arena and say, I'm going to get involved in a serve team because this is what it means in this moment for me to be in the arena. Love. Here's the invitation today. You want in the arena? I need you to love in a group. Love in a group. Groups are still open. The small groups of the Avenue Church, that's where I need for you to bring your love. Bring your love into the community of the local church, and then as we become one, the world will know. It is an amazing evangelical strategy when you commit to loving in the community of Christ. Love in a group, and then finally live. Live on mission. Live on mission. And let me define that for you. Live on mission means with this mentality of who's my one. I would ask that this year you commit to finding one person that you pray for, build a relationship with, and share Jesus with who does not know Jesus, and that when I can ask you in a week or two from now who's your one, you can identify that, and you stay with them for at least this year of building, praying, and inviting them to Jesus. Say this with me. I want in. Show this next slide. I want in. If you mean it, I'm going to give you one last chance to say it on three. One, two, three. Father, we ask that you would call us in like you've never done before. We know you live and thrive in the arena, and we want no one but you. In Christ's name, amen. I don't know if you know this about Frankie, but he came to this church, and he was a little exhausted by church. He loved Jesus, but, but church was a, a difficult thing for him a, a bit at the time. And then he played the guitar for maybe a year and just served quietly. And, and just like the progression of that song says, no one but Jesus can do these things because there's no one but Jesus I want. And by the end, you're like yelling it from the, from the tops and it becomes contagious. That's exactly what's happened to this man's life. To see it, yeah, absolutely. And it's what we're trusting will happen in 2020 and beyond for many to know that name of Jesus.
And now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may he make his face to shine upon you and within you as you live with greater expectations for what he wants to do through you and in you. May he grant you a desire to want to be in the arena. Amen and amen. Love you guys.